hello again. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce you to techniques for creating and managing modular content. If you're like most TECM 5191 students, this will probably be new information. You're going to use these digital literacy techniques in the single source project, and you're going to reflect on them along with your assigned reading in the discussion post for Module 3. Let's do it. So this lecture has actually four parts. I'm going to begin by describing how content is treated as modular. Second, I'll introduce topic-based authoring as a technique for creating modular content. Third, I'll explain how structured authoring techniques create better modular content. And fourth and finally, I'll explore how a model of all content can be used to maximize the likelihood users will find the module of content they need. So let's start with describing how content can be treated as modular. Your assigned source material for Module 2, that video presentation by Daniel Ferguson, explained why single source publishing is important. Well, modular content is the key to single source publishing. Content components are building blocks that can be combined in different ways and reused. Common terms for those building blocks include modules, granules, topics. In a 2015 review of research, Anderson and Batova found some consensus for using topic within TechCom. That's the term in the widely used open content standard known as DITA. It's also used in Flare. In this week's assigned reading, TechCom Pro Craig Wright calls the modular approach topic-based authoring. Instead of thinking about content in terms of documents, or pages, we need to think about it in terms of topics. Let me remind you of the results from this 2016 survey. These are the authoring tools that TechCom Pros told CIDM they were using in 2016. What I want to note now is that the most commonly used tools, that's DITA or XML, Flare, some versions of FrameMaker, they all support modular content. In fact, many of these tools support publishing content in a database, often referred to as a knowledge base, rather than in anything resembling a document. I want to clarify a little about the systems used to manage content. Enterprise content management systems are tools that organizations use to share all types of information, usually internally within the company. Two of the most widely used are Adobe Experience Manager, or AEM, and Microsoft SharePoint. Content management systems, on the other hand, are a little more specialized. They're used to publish content on the web. The two most widely used ones are WordPress and Drupal. Finally, component content management systems are highly specialized. They're used to publish modular content. Most, like XML Doc for AEM or EasyDITA, publish by implementing DITA standards for modular content. Flare's unique in that it supports modular content, but not DITA standards. I'll have more to say about this later in the lecture. Keith Shangili Roberts published an interesting piece on the job market for tech writers in 2019. His conclusion from tracking jobs on Indeed was that although it appears there are fewer jobs for tech writers every year, it's the titles of the jobs that are changing. The vast majority of these are now related to content strategy. That hinges on the ability to manage modular content. It's important for you to be aware people don't always mean the same thing when they refer to content strategy. This is largely the result of the business unit where the people who create content about products actually work. Let me try to explain. What I'm showing on the slide is a simple version of something called the sales funnel. Traditionally, TechCom pros create content that's delivered at the bottom of the funnel after a buyer makes a purchase. That's when they need, for example, an installation guide for the company's software product. The TechCom pro rarely works in their own business unit Typically, they work in engineering or software development alongside the people who are designing and building the products. For companies, in order to get prospective buyers to enter the top of the funnel, they need prospects to be aware of their content. That's why they produce advertising. The creators of that content are usually in a marketing unit within the company. In the past, TechCom and Marcom writers rarely interacted. 
Way back in 2014, Scott Abel, also known as the Content Wrangler, gave a presentation called The Future of Technical Communication is Marketing. I think he made a convincing case that customers are not well served by the separation of content within a company, like what I'm showing here on the slide. Abel said, and I quote, once a prospect buys a product or service, the content they interact with is no longer familiar. The instructions provided don't look, feel, or sound anything like the marketing and sales materials that introduce them to the brand. He continues, neither does the service contract, the warranty, the customer support website, the product documentation, or the training materials. All right, so I think we can conclude both Techcom and Marcom pros talk about content strategy. Sometimes they work more closely on content than in the past. Ideally, that would be the case. But they're usually talking about two distinct types of content when they use the term content strategy. And they usually use different types of content management systems for that content. Component content management systems, like the ones I mentioned on the previous slide, are rarely used outside of Techcom. As an aside, many people now refer to a customer journey rather than a sales funnel. That doesn't change any of the points I've made on this slide. That leads us to the second part of this lecture. Let's dive into topic-based authoring. While the concept of a topic as a building block is simple, turns out that defining it in practice is quite challenging. I'm going to simplify this as much as I can for you, but I want you to be aware there are many debates among techcom leaders about what counts as a well-formed topic. Let's use the example of a recipe for making an angel food cake. On the one hand, the entire recipe can be classified as a topic, one building block. This would be the case when using the principles for writing topics set out by Mark Baker in Every Page is Page One, or EPPO. It gained its name because Baker urges content creators to write for users who search for information to support a specific need. If you're looking for a recipe for angel food cake, you aren't likely to read a cookbook from the first page through to the last. Rather, you look in the index or maybe a table of contents to find the specific location of the recipe you want. On the web, you'd search, land on a page. If it didn't give you what you wanted, then you move on to the next page. So it's critical that a reader gets everything they need in a single topic. In contrast, Dita would likely break a single recipe into at least two topics, or at least it could. There'd be the portion with the steps for making the angel food cake, that would be one topic, and then the list of ingredients would be a separate topic. In reality, the reader of the recipe might never know because the two topics or these building blocks would be combined into the same page in a book or the same page on a website but underneath they'd be separate building blocks. As Wright wrote in your assigned reading this week, I'm quoting, even when I was working in Word or Frame Maker, creating non-topic content, the stuff I was writing was well suited to the transition to topics. Each section dealt with one specific subject, was designed to work as a standalone piece, and had cross-references to any other sections that were relevant. So we can conclude from that, if you're thinking of writing content already, like independent sections, then the move to topic-based authoring is gonna be easier for you. If you still think of everything you write as a book, you're gonna face greater challenges. Part of the controversy about what counts as a high quality topic is captured in a blog post from Mark Baker from 2012. I'm gonna let you read the quote here. What Baker's saying is that topics must be meaningful and useful to readers or users. This has implications, especially when we consider how content from existing documents is imported into a component content management system, like Flare, which automatically splits the content, for example, everything between level one headings, into a single topic file. Simply publishing those existing topics as individual web page entries would result in the abomination Baker calls a Franken book. Flares build on the concept of topics, but most pros agree topic-based authoring is only truly valuable if it's used in tandem with structured authoring. So in part three of the lecture, I'll expand upon your understanding of topic-based authoring by explaining the principles behind the techniques in structured authoring. In a 2015 article, 
A couple of researchers named Anderson and Batova wrote, structured content is written and organized in a consistent way according to predefined rules. There are older language options like standard generalized markup language or SGML, but today XML is the standard. One of the pros to using XML is that it's also used for much data beyond technical content. Let me borrow an example from the folks at Scriptorium who wrote a great white paper on structured authoring in XML. The link's in the references for this module on Canvas. Referring to our recipe for angel food cake again, I'll start by noting that the content that makes up that recipe, whether it's one topic or two, is tagged as elements. For example, the tag name is given a value here. The tagging should look familiar to you as it's quite similar to the tags used in HTML. But in XML, those tags are semantic. They're about meaning, not format. If we want to structure the content of a recipe, one of the things we have to recognize is what types of elements are common to all of them. Not only do recipes need a name, but they need ingredients. They need instructions. One of the great things about structured content is we can ensure that every recipe must have the content inside the instruction tags. Maybe also that instruction elements must always come after ingredient elements. We definitely need more elements to accurately tag ingredients like item, quantity, preparation. We can decide that every ingredient must have content inside the item and quantity tags, but make preparation content optional. So this brief example should give you a sense of how the content inside a topic can be structured as data. I'll mention three advantages related specifically to structured authoring. First, writers need less training and oversight by editors because the content requirements for a type of topic are enforced while they create content. Every writer must add quantity for an ingredient, for example. Second advantage, formatting content is totally separate from creating it. We can tell the authoring system to make all ingredients appear in a certain style dictated by CSS automatically. And the third advantage, content can be searched easily for whatever elements of structure were used. For example, by finding all of the content authored by Jenny. In addition, content can be searched easily by users. In fact, many companies publish their technical content in what they call a knowledge base. I mentioned this earlier. It's clearly not the same genre as a document with a specific purpose, like a cookbook or an installation guide. You can structure content by making up your own rules and then enforcing them in templates that the writers use where you work to create new topics, or we can adopt rules that are industry standards. Ulrich Parson wrote an article in 2019 about technical communication standards. She talks about so-called smart factories of the 21st century. These are made up of machines and devices from different manufacturers which are combined in a single or common process. This means documentation used by those to install and maintain those devices has to integrate information from all those different manufacturers and deliver it in a single app on a tablet. That's only possible if all the documentation has been authored with the same standards. Parsons lists several relevant ones, but DITA is by far the most widely used for technical content. That's what it was designed for. DITA stands for Darwin Information Typing Architecture. It's implemented in XML, maintained by a nonprofit group called OASIS, was first developed by IBM, but it's now an open standard. We don't have time to study DITA in depth, but you're going to learn about the most commonly used content models for topics in DITA, tasks, references, and concepts. Let me help you understand the models for these three topic types. I'm borrowing examples from a company called Jorsic. They sell an authoring tool called Easy Dita, a product something like Madcap Flare, but implementing Dita standards. Jorsic's technical content development guide was created for their own content developers, but they've made it available to anyone. You'll find the link to it on Canvas for module three and the references for instructional material. And it's also in the topic-based and structured authoring tutorial assignment. So we're going to start with task topics because I think they're the easiest to understand. 
Jorsic tells their writers that task topics provide step-by-step -step procedures for completing a task. When writing task topics, be sure that it answers the question, how do I, whatever it is. As you saw when I discussed the recipe example a few minutes ago, a topic, in this case a task, is made up of elements. In Ditta, all task topics have a title, a short description, and a task body. The task body is made up of an optional prerequisite and then steps, which are divided into a step and a result. Note that there are guidelines for creating each element in a topic. For example, the title of a task topic element must begin with a gerund. Think verb plus ing, like toasting in this example. The second basic topic type in Ditta is a concept. Jorsic tells their content creators that concept topics should communicate in a clear, concise, precise, and complete way the essential information for understanding a concept. They answer the question, what is whatever it is? In Ditta, all concept topics have a title, a short description, and a concept body made up of sections, which are made up of paragraphs, perhaps other elements like lists, Again, there are guidelines for creating each element in a concept topic. The guidelines for creating a short description are the same for tasks and concepts, but a title for a concept topic must use nouns like toast or classic instead of gerunds. The third basic topic type is a reference. Jorsic says reference topics provide specification information that supports conceptual information and task completion. These topics provide detailed, quickly assessed data, most often in tables. In Ditta, all reference topics have a title, a short description, and a reference body made up of one or more sections. A section might include a table, or an example, or both. Note again that there are guidelines for creating each element in a topic. The guidelines for creating a short description are the same for all topic types. Describe the purpose in less than 50 words, provide search content. The guidelines for creating a title for a reference are similar to those for a concept. Use nouns or noun phrases. This example, toaster classic specifications. Ditta includes some other topic types. It also allows you to customize Ditta elements or topics to align with your own content model. Now you know a little about structured authoring and content models for topics. I want to address Flare specifically. Flare does not support Ditta directly. However, you could borrow some of its concepts to accomplish structured authoring. For example, you can follow guidelines like those we've seen in previous slides for writing topic titles. These titles are the most important content for search results. You can do several additional things to make it easier to reuse topics and to enhance search for online publication. For example, you can add both titles and short descriptions using Flare's Topic Properties function. Short descriptions go in the field called Meta Description, and then they appear in search results. Another structured authoring technique you can implement with Flare is the use of topic templates. Although you cannot use Ditta XML tags for elements in Flare, you can create templates with placeholder text and actually with special XML tags. For a task topic template, you could add a paragraph saying, replace this text with step one. And then a following paragraph saying, replace this text with the result of step one. This way, the template guides authors to create appropriate content for each task topic. I'll add additional items to the list of what you can do in Flare after the next part of the lecture. Having well-structured individual topics is only part of the structure you need to develop for your content. In part four, we continue talking about structured content, but we'll explore the practice of modeling content at a macro level instead of at the individual topic level. A complete content model tells you how all of your individual topics fit together. Think about a print cookbook. Readers can find an angel food cake recipe by using tools like the table of contents. Creating a table of contents requires a model of the content in the cookbook. In other words, the collection of recipes has been sorted into categories. The standard would be to do that by dish type, appetizer, entree, side dish, dessert, so on. 
Because those categories might not meet the needs of every reader's recipe search, books also have an index, usually at the back, with recipes categorized in different ways, alphabetically by main ingredient, or maybe by geographic cuisine. For talking about the web, you might start looking for a recipe on a specific site with navigation aids, something like a table of contents. That's what you see on the left-hand side of this screenshot. In 2014, Nielsen Norman Group published an article about the difference between information architecture, IA, and navigation. This is an important one to grasp. Let's say Blue Apron used their table of contents from a print cookbook to create the navigation on their website. That content model isn't going to be adequate for all users looking for recipes, or even for all of the content on their website. Instead, they need the kind of model an information architect would build before ever designing navigation. IA is documented in spreadsheets and diagrams, not in wireframes. While we can't get into great detail about IA, I do want to help you think through the steps in the process of modeling content the way it's typically done by IA. Some of these steps will be familiar to you, especially if you've already taken the content strategy course. For instance, IA begins with a content inventory, where you locate and identify all existing content. The second step is a content audit, where you evaluate that content for usefulness, uh, things like accuracy, tone of voice, overall effectiveness. The third step involves information grouping, where you describe the relationship between different pieces of content. Step four includes taxonomy development, where you define naming conventions that we're going to apply to all of your content. The fifth step involves metadata creation to help users discover your content. Let's look at these last three steps in just a little more detail. As I said earlier, all content management systems treat content as data. To build a model of all the digital content in a complex organizational website like Blue Aprons is a huge undertaking. Let's look at an information grouping of some of Blue Aprons customer facing web content. I'm not going to show you a spreadsheet with the results of the first two steps that produced a content inventory and audit. Just assume that there is one. To describe the relationships between all those pieces of content, we're going to draw diagrams to represent what's in the spreadsheet. Ideally, we would involve Blue Apron's users in this step. This gray box represents the information type menu, shown in green highlighting. By looking at the content inventory, we see menu has five attributes. Those are shown in white. Meals, which can be two or three a week. Servings, which can be two or four people per meal. Pricing, which can be signature, premium, or vegetarian. Date. That could be an actual date, as well as current week or upcoming week. And finally, recipes available based on the other four attributes. We continue grouping information shown in our spreadsheet into other info types and develop ingredient, technique, supplier, wine, marketplace, and of course, meal. This isn't anything like a complete model of information groups, but it should be enough to get the idea. You might notice some info types appear as attributes in others. For example, wine is an attribute of marketplace and recipe, but wine is also an information type and has its own attributes. In our model, we show that wine is related to marketplace and recipe by connecting our boxes with lines. I should probably point out that the attributes for recipe or meal are not the same as the elements used to create a topic in the DITA standard for tasks. Recipes are a very specific type of task. We might develop a specialized or custom DITA topic called recipe or one for technique based on task topic elements. Once we've grouped our information, we can begin developing a taxonomy of it. Taxonomy is an entire discipline, so I'm not going to do it justice here. Just think about all of the information types and their attributes listed on the previous slide. One of the most important goals in step four is to create a controlled vocabulary by choosing preferred terms among synonyms. For our Blue Apron content, will we refer to a whisk as a tool or a utensil? 
We also choose how terms relate to one another in hierarchies. So will shrimp and fish be labeled as seafood or will fish and seafood be separate categories? We want all of our content to be consistent, to be meaningful to our users, and to fit with our voice or brand. Once we've developed a taxonomy, we can start applying it to our content. Here's what I created in step three for the information type wine. It has seven attributes. Knowing something about how Blue Apron's users search for content, we could decide we want to explicitly use either the attributes or maybe even the values for those attributes that are shown in these green boxes. Not only will we determine which terms should appear in the actual written content, but we'll also determine when to use them as metadata, which can be hidden or listed explicitly. Either way, it helps users find the content they want when they're searching on Blue Apron's website. Let's return to what you can do to support structured authoring in Flair. So this is structured authoring plus content modeling at the macro level. I mentioned the first four items earlier in this lecture when we were focused on topic-based and structured authoring. I have three more to add now that we've talked about macro level content modeling. One important technique is to identify and tag keywords in the content of your topic files. Your keywords should be based on the taxonomy you created. While keywords are used to create an index for print, they also help users find the right topics in search on the web. Keywords tagged in titles and meta descriptions within Flare are weighted the most heavily in search results. Flare also allows you to add hidden text in headings. You can include metadata, either attributes or their values, the ones that your users might search with but that are not part of your taxonomy in terms of preferred terms. Finally, Flare provides three search engine options for users of your content. Two of those allow you to create and display micro content, those are more complete snippets that you're now used to seeing in something like a Google search. So to summarize the main points of this lecture, first, the most used authoring tools for tech content support publishing it as modules, components in a database, often referred to as a knowledge base, rather than in anything that resembles a document. Second, I said that if you already write chunks of content as standalone pieces that are cross-referenced to other relevant chunks, then the move to topic-based authoring is going to be easier for you. But if you still think of everything you write as a book, you're going to face greater challenges. Third, structured content means writing and organizing topics in a consistent way according to predefined rules. Those rules can be created by a small group of individuals in one company, or they can be adopted as an industry standard like DITA. I made the point that although Flare cannot implement DITA directly, it can be used for structured authoring. Finally, we explored the steps in the process of modeling content the way it's typically done in information architecture, or IA. We focused on information grouping, developing a taxonomy, and creating metadata. These techniques promise more satisfying search results for users of your web content. Another value of a macro-level content model is its use for auditing content found during an inventory. So if you find something that doesn't fit into your model, it probably should be deleted. On the other hand, if you don't find any content for something that you want in your ideal content model, you probably need to create it. If you want to develop your expertise in content modeling, I highly recommend a 2017 book titled Designing Connected Content. You'll find it listed in the references for the instructional material for Module 3. All right, we have covered a lot of ground in this lecture. It's time for you to use what you've heard along with your reading to tackle the assignments in Module 3. Reach out if you have questions about the individual tutorial or about the single source project. Good luck.